Boldwood presents The Mistress, written by Valerie Keogh and read by Julie Maisie and Rose Robinson. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Part 1 Hannah Chapter 1 I was brushing my hair when Ivan came into the bedroom. He said nothing, just stood there looking at me. I wasn't easily intimidated, but he was a big man and he had an air about him that said he could resort to violence if necessary. He operated in the shadier end of the world of finance. Shady, but incredibly lucrative. Perhaps there he needed to intimidate when necessary. I'd seen the way his lackeys bowed and scraped to him, the wary look in their eyes. I'd even heard the words they'd muttered behind his back when they thought nobody was listening. But although our relationship was coming apart like the seams on a cheap shirt, I was still his wife. Before we'd married, he'd treated me like a goddess. Afterwards, within a few months, I was relegated to a mere female. He'd recently begun to cast aspersions, but he'd never been violent. Until now. I was stunned and cried out when he knocked the brush from my hand, grabbed my hair and dragged me from the stool to the floor. How about telling me exactly what these are for? He said, pressing a card of tablets into my face, the foil scratching my skin. It's hard to think sensibly when your hair is being pulled from your scalp, so I jumped to the first lie I could squeeze out. They're for headaches, remember? I get them now and then. It might have worked. It was true that I suffered, although it was more frequently a convenient excuse. He pulled me to my feet, ignoring my squeal of pain. I checked, bitch. He crushed the card against my mouth. The contraceptive pill. You've been lying to me all these months. I might have explained to him then that I wasn't happy in the marriage, that it had been a mistake, and bringing a child into it wasn't going to make it any better. I would have, if he hadn't drawn his hand back and walloped me across the face. His other hand was still wrapped in my hair so I wasn't knocked to the ground but it felt as if my brain was rattling against the walls of my skull. Lie, milking me for every penny you can get your grubby little hands on. You'd never had any intention of giving me a child, did you? Pain can make people say anything. It's why torture is so effective. No, I didn't. It was a stupid time to choose to be honest. A crazy time to tell him, you're not fit to be a father. Nor was I fit to be a mother, but there was no time to explore that as he drew his hand back for a second time. Held as I was, it was impossible to avoid the blow. This time, though, he released my hair as he hit and I was thrown against the wall. It seemed a good idea to slide to the floor not that I had a choice. The blow had stunned me. Foolishly, I thought that was it. That he'd leave me there and take his anger downstairs to drown it in whiskey. It took the toe of his shoes hitting my ribs to alert me to the danger I was in. But by then, it was too late. I don't know how long the assault lasted. I was out of it by the third or fourth kick. When I came to, I was swaddled in the duvet pulled from our bed. I didn't know if he'd thrown it around me in a last kindly gesture before leaving me there, or whether I'd pulled it down in an attempt to protect myself from his blows. Whatever the reason, it was a soft surface to lie on until I could bring myself to move. I wasn't sure when that would be. It seemed that every part of my body hurt. 
I was still alive, so consoled myself with the hope that he'd done no serious damage. Shock can override pain, knocking you out to allow your body time to recover. I woke a few times, once for long enough to drag myself up onto the bed and rest my throbbing head on a pillow. Part of me expected Ivan to come and check on me. Part of me afraid of what he'd do if he did. I looked around for my mobile. Unable to see it, I guessed he'd taken it with him. It didn't matter. There was nobody to ring. Ringing the police crossed my mind briefly, but before I could decide, I fell asleep again, away from the pain. When I awoke, I knew from the change in the light that it was a long time later. I uncurled and lifted my head a little to listen. He was staying remarkably quiet. Maybe he was embarrassed by his loss of temper. Not enough to come and apologise, though. I turned, gasping in pain. Whereas earlier, various parts of me hurt individually. Now it was a full, all-consuming blanket of pain. To add to my discomfort, I needed to wee. I shuffled carefully, painfully, to the side of the bed and attempted to get to my feet. When that appeared to be beyond my abilities, I crawled slowly, hand, knee, hand, knee, stopping every few inches to catch my breath gasping when that sent a dagger of pain through my chest. The cold tiles of the ensuite bathroom were torture to cross, and I peppered the floor with tears. And then there was the struggle to get onto the toilet, grasping the rim, pulling myself up, groaning in pain as I turned to sit. More pain then, even more when I peed, unsurprised when I looked into the toilet bowl to see it streaked with blood. I used the side of the bath to push to my feet rather than crawling again. It was a bad idea, standing, because now I could see myself in the bathroom mirror. I gasped in shock and lifted a hand to my face. Nothing seemed broken, but my face was a mess. Red carpet burns across one cheek, purple bruising on both, my top lip bloody and swollen. Multiple marks of his ire dotted both arms, and when I pulled up my T-shirt, I gulped to see the mass of bruising on both sides. Bastard, I muttered. I wasn't planning on ringing the police, but I needed to make him pay for what he'd done to me. For that, I needed my phone. A photo, after all, was worth a thousand words. It took a long time to negotiate the stairs. I clung on to the banisters with both hands, gasping at each step downward, grunting as pain overwhelmed me, waiting till it eased before moving again. There were plenty of tears and moments when I was certain I couldn't go on before I made it to the hallway. The door to the kitchen seemed a million miles away. I was desperate enough by then to call out for Ivan, my voice a plaintive squeak that wouldn't have been heard on the other side of any of the closed doors. Trying again, the sound fading quickly into a silence that suddenly struck me as unusual. Normally, if he was home, Ivan would have the TV blasting. The bastard must have gone out. It seemed I was on my own. I should be used to that. Reaching the kitchen door, I pushed it open. Pain was slowing everything down, including my reactions, so it took a few seconds to understand what I was seeing, and a few more to realise that the body stretched out on the kitchen floor was my darling husband's. Chapter Two even if I'd been able, I wouldn't have rushed to his side. Instead, I stood in the doorway, 
trying to decide whether I could see the rise and fall of his chest to indicate he was alive, or whether I was in luck and the vicious bastard had popped his clogs. But tears had blurred my eyesight, and it wasn't until I had shuffled painfully across the room that I realised I was out of luck yet again. He was breathing. As I stood looking down at him, wondering what I should do, he opened his eyes and glared at me. What? Had the beating I'd suffered affected my hearing? What? He screwed up his face. No, half his face. Then tried again. The strangled sounds made no sense. It took a while before clarity dawned on my pain-racked brain. A stroke. He'd had a stroke. He'd probably pushed his blood pressure up while he was beating the living crap out of me. Karma. The idea made me smile, then grimace and lift a finger to my burst lip. I looked down at him and sneered. Is that you saying sorry? I would have liked to have kicked him where it hurt, and would have done if every movement didn't cause me agony. My phone was on the counter. It took me several minutes to take photographs of the bruises that streaked and coloured my body, reaching painfully to document as many as possible. Only when I was done did I press triple nine. Perhaps it was the way I spoke, my voice barely above a whisper, rather than what I said, that had both police and two ambulances arriving not many minutes later. I struggled to the door in anticipation as they pulled up, one in front of the other. The posse to my rescue. They were gentle with me, helping me onto a trolley, wrapping me in a blanket. I hadn't realised I was shivering till then. I hadn't realised I was crying until one of the paramedics wiped a cool cloth over my face. Hush, don't cry. You're safe now. They must have given me something for the pain because next I knew I was in a cubicle, surrounded on three sides by a white curtain, leads trailing from various parts of me to monitors that beat reassuringly. There were voices, but none I recognised and none were directed my way. When someone did come, a scrub-suited man who looked about 16 and who introduced himself as Dr. Peterson, the pain had returned. He checked my notes and peered knowledgeably at the monitors, as if to reassure himself, and perhaps me, that he knew what he was doing. Despite everything, he said, you're probably concerned about your husband, so I'll set your mind at rest by saying he's in a stable condition. The next 24 hours will be crucial. His rather cherub-like countenance was marred by a sudden frown. Unfortunately, lying on that hard floor for the length of time he was has resulted in some consequences for him. I could have told him that I didn't care about Ivan's condition. Certainly wasn't interested in any consequences, that all I wanted to do was get more of whatever drug they'd given me and drift off. When the doctor looked as if he was going to elaborate on my husband's plight, I moved slightly, then groaned. No acting skills were required. The pain was incredible. Okay, Peterson said. Let's concentrate on getting you sorted. He vanished, returning a moment later with a nurse in tow. There was some muttering, some fiddling with the intravenous line that was attached to my right arm, and then merciful relief. Over the next few hours, as I drifted in and out of sleep, I was x-rayed, scanned, examined by people whose names and qualifications were heard in a drug-filled haze, suffered someone struggling to find a vein in my bruised arms, from which they eventually drained what seemed like an awful lot of blood. 
everything was explained to me in great detail that was forgotten as soon as heard. Finally, I was wheeled into a small, four-bedded room and held. A nurse bustled about, settling me, checking the monitors, asking me incessantly if there was anything I needed. No, I said, not for the first time. I'm okay, thank you. The buzz of whatever they'd given me earlier had worn off, but the vicious pain I'd experienced had eased to a dull ache. I needed to think. It was better to be alert. The nurse fussed about a little longer, then apologetically said, There's a couple of coppers outside who want to have a word. Do you think you're up to it? Definitely better to be alert if I was going to speak to them. Not that I had anything to worry about, nothing to hide. I was blameless in this. For a change... I was the victim. They didn't need to know that I planned to make Ivan pay for what he'd done to me. They didn't need to know that at all. Chapter 3 I'm not quite certain why I married Ivan. After I graduated from university, I took a position with a very exclusive public relations company. It had been my plan to work hard and make my way to the top. That was before I discovered what an incredibly vicious world it was. I'd thought I was tough, but compared to some of the barracudas I met, I was a helpless kitten. So I did what women had done for centuries. I took the easy way out. I was beautiful, educated, charming if the situation required any man's perfect other half. And there were plenty of men who'd happily pay for the option. Not pay-pay, I wasn't a prostitute, although I suppose there are others who would argue that accepting accommodation, credit cards, spending money, whatever I needed, was akin to being paid. I considered I was making use of my natural talents. So, why did I marry Ivan? Because I'd noticed two things when I hit 39. The first was that it took more time and money to keep looking as good as I did. The second was that I'd started to compare myself with the other women who crowded the pubs and clubs I frequented. The equally beautiful, younger women. It became increasingly obvious that the men I was attracted to were attracted to them. Anyone who argued that it came down to personality was fooling themselves. In the busy nightlife that was upmarket London in the 2020s, it was appearance. It was around that time of self-doubt that Ivan wandered into my orbit. He was rich, handsome enough for a man pushing 70, and flatteringly attentive. He courted me with weekends away in five-star hotels, a diamond bracelet, I admired in Tiffany's on a weekend to New York. Shopping trips to Harrods, everything a woman like me could desire. Marry me, he'd said while we were out for dinner one night, only a couple of months after meeting. He reached into his pocket, pulled out a ring box and flicked it open with his thumb. The sparkle of the diamond under the restaurant lights almost took my breath away. It was a huge, almost vulgarly large, solitaire. I had always been against marriage or any kind of commitment. My father, who had walked out on us, on me, when I was only ten, had a lot to answer for. It was thanks to him that I was unwilling to put myself in the position of being abandoned again. But now that I was pushing forty, perhaps it was time to be clever and think of my future. I looked at Ivan in that upmarket restaurant, saw his shirt stretch across his paunch, the buttons straining to hold him in, and thought maybe this would be a good move for me. He was almost seventy, overweight, with a high colour in his cheeks. He drank too much and smoked cigars where he could. He looked like a man who wouldn't make old bones. 
I didn't think there was any fear he might abandon me. Dying was a different matter, and his death would leave me more than comfortably off. Yes, I said, sliding my hand across the table to allow him to slip the ring in place. I'll marry you. Marry in haste. Who doesn't know the second part of that annoying epigram? Ivan had mentioned a family home a few miles away from Windsor. What he hadn't said was that this is where he expected us to live. All the bloody time. He had an office there and still ran his financial business from it. He also made it more than clear that he'd expected to hear the pitter-patter of tiny feet in the not-too-distant future. I quickly became disillusioned with the turn my life had taken. I'd turned into a damn housewife. The most Ivan would countenance was a cleaner once a fortnight. And even then, he insisted they had to be supervised in every room, for fear they might damage some of the tatty family heirlooms in his twee chintz. It didn't take me long to discover my beloved husband didn't love me. It shouldn't have come as a surprise. I didn't love him either. The big problem was in the level of our expectations. I'd got what I'd wanted, although being buried in the countryside wasn't exactly how I'd envisaged my life. But he didn't get what he wanted. A child. Ivan had waited till he was almost seventy before realising he wanted one and expected his wife to be a broodmare. He chose me because I was beautiful and would, he assumed, have beautiful babies. He also assumed I was far younger than I was. But what woman of a certain age doesn't lie and subtract a couple of years? Or six, in my case. When there was no sign of a child appearing, the distance between us, already Grand Canyon-sized, grew deeper. I began to see dislike rather than possessiveness in his gaze, to feel a chilly reluctance in the press of his lips against my cheek. Until that final day, when the discovery of what he'd have seen as my treachery tipped him over the edge into vicious hatred. I was kept a few days in hospital before being released, with a warning to return if I suffered any headaches or if the blood in my wee returned. It was another couple of weeks before Ivan was allowed home. He was only home a couple of days when I knew I couldn't stay. It was something unbelievably simple that gave me that final push. I'd been searching through the bookshelves in our living room in search of a book to lift my mood discounting ones I'd never read in favour of ones I'd read and knew would suit, where, if they weren't quite happy ever after, the main female character always came out on top. I needed that story, to know that it existed somewhere. I was on my knees, searching through the lower shelves, pulling out each book, one by one, shoving it back in frustration when it wasn't what I needed. And then I came to a book I hadn't read in years. It perfectly suited the mood I was in, and I lifted it out with a smile. Struggling wearily to my feet, I crossed to the sofa, sat and curled up. Ready to dive into the book, I flicked the pages to the start of chapter one, unsurprised when something fell from between the pages. I had a habit of using whatever came to hand as a bookmark, and frequently found receipts, scraps of paper, old envelopes between... Whatever this was, it fluttered once before landing face down on the carpet. It was slightly out of reach, and moving still caused me some discomfort. But as I read, my eyes kept flicking towards it, so that after only a few pages, I grunted in annoyance, put the book down on the back of the sofa, and swung my legs slowly to the floor. I reached for the small card and turned it over with little curiosity, my eyes widening when I realised it was a photograph of me and an old boyfriend. 
shuffling along the sofa, I held it closer to the lamp. I knew who it was, of course. Mark Shepard. How could I forget a man who'd loved me so desperately? I turned to look at the back. Nothing written there. It didn't matter. It took only seconds to remember when it was taken. Twenty years before. My last year in university. The knuckling down year. I brushed a finger over his face and reached for the memory. It came back like a caress from the past, and for the first time since Ivan's attack, I felt a lessening of the tension and fear that had gripped me. Mark had made me feel loved. I should never have let him go. Chapter Four Mark Shepard. I'd seen him that first week in university when I was still buzzing with excitement to be in Bristol, away from home, everything, everybody oozing with potential. Like most women, I'd checked out every handsome or near handsome guy, marking them out of ten based only on appearance. We were young, self-obsessed and superficial. Mark had a rather babyish round face his physique gangly and boyish, but he'd still warranted a second look and ticked a healthy seven on my personal hunkometer. I was reading public relations and psychology. He was reading psychology and law, so we shared several modules, but we never became friendly. He was always on the periphery of the crowd, pushed there by more vocal, active, assertive guys who were simply more fun to be with. My first year in university, I lived on the campus. The accommodation was expensive, convenient, and came with a long list of rules and regulations. My mother was footing the bill, so the cost didn't bother me. It was the grating rules and reg. When I told my mother that I wanted to move out, I could hear the edge of worry in her voice. Not for me, not for any fear of my safety off campus, no. I knew exactly what she was afraid of. That if I were unhappy, I'd give up and return home permanently. I could feel my lips curl in a sneer. That wouldn't please her at all. Our relationship was one of filial and maternal duty, not of love. I wasn't sure she even liked me. I knew she'd be happier too if I wasn't going home for the holidays. I tried to keep my voice carefully neutral as I explained how much easier it would be if I stayed in Bristol for the summer. I could have a look for a job when I get home, of course, see if I can find something in Thornbury. I don't want to be sitting around all summer, getting under your feet. Could you get a job easily there? This was quicker than I'd expected. Maybe I was being foolish and she'd already considered this. Maybe I'd underestimated her. Yes. I drew out the word, as if I was thinking of this idea for the first time. It might be the best bet, really. Stay here for the summer, as long as you're still happy to pay for my accommodation. There was the merest hesitation before she replied. I suppose it's worth looking for something off campus, as long as it doesn't cost more. I did find somewhere cheaper. I'd already become friendly with a few students who were in the same boat as me, and together we trawled websites to find somewhere suitable. We weren't fussy, cheap being the only stipulation any of us made. The house we found was a ramshackle dump, a 15-minute walk from the university campus. There were three bedrooms and a tired bathroom upstairs. Downstairs, what had been a living room and dining room, made two more bedrooms, and a poorly built extension housed a second bathroom. This had been added to the main house so badly that if it rained heavily, rivulets ran down the inside wall. On a sunny day, if you leaned your head back and peered upward, 
you could see a crack filled with celestial blue. That first year together was wild. None of us cared that the place was a dump. We could do what we liked, and frequently did. There were no restrictions on parties or drinking or drugs. So we did them all. And each other. Boyfriends came and went with blithe regularity, in a series of mutual, e the men's faces almost interchangeable in their young, immature handsomeness, their bodies muscular and athletic. It was all so easy. Of the five who lived in that grotty house, I was the only one who'd never taken an official part-time job to make ends meet. This was thanks in part to the largesse of my mother, but mostly to my unofficial part-time job. The generosity of some of the men I dated. After all, what was the point in having a fabulous body if I wasn't going to use it for something more than ornamental? Anyway, it wasn't as if it was hard work. The men were always older, sometimes very old, and pitiful. In fact, I'd often wondered if there was a direct correlation between how pitiful they were and how much they were willing to pay for my company. It was the only amusement I had from the encounters. But facing into the final year, I knew things had to change. I had already applied for a position with one of the bigger public relations firms in London. It didn't pay well at entry level, but I intended to race up the corporate ladder. Getting a first would almost guarantee me the position. I was clever, just unfocused and easily distracted. I had no choice but to step away from my social circle. Difficult to do. Worse if I noticed how well they were partying without me. My absence of as little import as a glass of water taken from a pond. It was torture. I thought my friends would come looking for me, but when I met them in the lecture halls, it was as if they hadn't even noticed my absence at whatever social event had taken place the previous night. That was the superficiality of our relationships. There was nobody I was close to, no bosom buddy to bend my ear and fill me in on what was happening. I didn't care. It made it easier to take a step back, to focus on the end game. It was at that point that I really noticed Mark. In the two years since I'd first spotted his potential, he'd filled out. More man than boy now. I saw him in the library, looking as if he belonged there, hunched over his books, one spread open in front of him. A notebook to one side as he took notes, his pen scribbling furiously. His concentration was total, intense. His dogged concentration inspired me to... It kept me from getting bored. Before long, I found myself fascinated by him. I had often given psychology lectures a miss, but started to attend them, scanning the hall from the doorway, eyes scanning the tiered rows for his tousled head of dark hair. Over the next few weeks, I slowly moved closer to Mark in the lecture hall, until finally, I was sitting almost directly in front of him. He was always one of the last to leave. I'd watched him as he checked over the notes he'd taken before packing everything carefully away as other students milled around, laughing and talking. I waited for my moment, that slight lull when the noisiest of the students had left and the next influx of students hadn't yet begun. Good lecture wasn't it? I said, pushing my expensively highlighted blonde hair back, all the better to peer up at him. I broadened my smile and fluttered my eyelashes. Oh yes, I could play the game when I wanted to. I let my hair fall and gestured towards the dais. This was such a great lecture that my head is spinning. I'm going to get some coffee and see if I can make sense of it all. 
I nodded and moved on a few steps, turning with a frown. You know the way they say two heads are better than one? Do you fancy joining me? Perhaps we could chat about what he said. It'd help make it clear, I think. I laughed in feigned embarrassment. Sorry, forget it. It probably already is to you. I was a firm believer that subtlety was wasted on men, so my invitation was clear. Pointed, even. If he took it to mean that I wasn't very bright, or certainly less intelligent than he was, if we got to know each other better, he'd soon learn that was incorrect. I was, as the teachers in my school used to say with heavy sarcasm, too clever for my own good. But I could do dim like the best of them. Sure. He nodded towards the exit. We'd better get out of here anyway, unless you want to stay to listen to a lecture in information technology. I wasn't sure if this was supposed to be a joke. Then he grinned and I laughed to cover my sigh of relief. There were several cafes dotted around the university. We went to the closest and were soon seated at a small table near the back. It was a little airless, but that worked in my favour. After a few minutes, sipping our drinks, I... It's warm in here, isn't it? I slipped the jacket I was wearing off and let it drop to the back of my chair. I was wearing a long-sleeved cotton T-shirt, the material worn thin by years of washing. It was a favourite of mine. I'd wear it till it fell apart, and probably for a while afterwards. I plucked at it, pulling at the V-neck and huffing a breath down my cleavage. I saw him look. A quick flick of his eyes. Enough, I hoped, to show an interest. I'd have been pissed if I'd wasted all this time on a man who wasn't interested in women. And if he liked women, there was no reason he wouldn't be interested in me. I was the perfect package. Nature had given me an ample bosom, slim waist and long legs, all of which I was more than content to show off, given the opportunity. I was often described as beautiful, sometimes exotic. Mind you. When people got to know me better, the word that was most often used to describe me was bitch. I had no illusions. It was much more appropriate. I hooked one arm on the back of the chair, the better to show off my attributes, and reached for the glass of coke with my free hand. So, what did you think of the lecture? It was good. The professor is an excellent lecturer. I like the way he backs up what he says by citing documented research. Mark had a low, melodic voice, and a way with words that kept my attention, even when the subject matter began to pall. He was knowledgeable about the subject, and it took no more than the odd, hmm, of agreement from me to keep him talking. He'd soon leave. I knew his timetable better than I knew my own, and he had one of his law lectures next. Since, as far as I could gather, he never missed one, there was no point in trying to lure him away with promises of a quick tumble. He was still talking, using his hands to make a point, his face alive with enthusiasm I could never master for any of my courses. His face, slightly cherubic two years before, had slimmed down. It was divided by an aquiline nose, set over lips that were fuller than usual for a man. I imagined them locked to mine, then moving lower. Much lower. I shivered. You okay? he asked with quick concern. He looked up to the air conditioning unit set among the pipes. They can belt out cold air sometimes. You better be careful you don't catch a chill. We could go somewhere and you could warm me up. It's what I'd have said to any of the other men I knew, and we'd leave and head to my room or theirs, or to one of the shady private places dotted around the university campus, the maintenance rooms on the ground floor of the main building, 
the groundsmen's huts, which were supposed to be locked, but rarely were. Even to the shrubbery by the north wall. I'd used them all over the last couple of years. But as I looked across the table and took in his genuinely concerned expression, I knew this guy was different. Or maybe I was. This studying lark. Perhaps it had altered my brain chemistry. I stood up so abruptly, he reared back, startled. Sorry. I ran a hand through my hair. I forgot I have a tutorial, I better run. I gathered my books, my bag, my coat, and with them threatening to fall from my arms at every stop, I hurried across the cafe. He called my name. I heard it drifting over the hubbub, humming there before dissipating and dying before I'd reached the exit. I'd lied. I had no tutorial. There were lectures I should attend, but even my newfound desire to succeed couldn't get me to attend any more that day. Instead, I dropped the books I'd borrowed back to the library and headed off to my digs. It was a relief to find nobody home. I needed silence to get my thoughts in order. Mark. He'd shimmied under my skin. It was that strange feeling that had sent me racing from the cafe. It might have been love. Chapter 5 Love wasn't a concept I was familiar with. I had a more than passing acquaintance with lust. There were no strings, no need for chemistry or promises of everlasting devotion. A quick wham-bam thanks very much and on to the next. It was what I was used to. It was what I wanted. A mutually enjoyable experience where it didn't bother me if they didn't call, didn't show up, didn't care. I was the same. Every relationship a come day, go day one. I wasn't looking for more and certainly not in the year where I was supposed to be knuckling down to my studies. But it was too late. Mark was waiting in the entrance to the lecture hall the next time our schedules coincided. He merely reached for my hand and held it in his as other students swirled past, oblivious to the little drama being enacted. For months, I was the perfect girlfriend. We studied together, attended lectures together when we could, discussed them afterwards, teasing out the ideas until they made sense to both of us. I even began to dress differently. Less pseudo-goth, more pseudo-geek. If the new persona amused me, I'm not sure Mark ever noticed. He was sloppily adoring, and I could have worn rags and he'd still have smiled in appreciation. It was uplifting, almost overwhelming, utterly satisfying. He treated me as if I was made of fine porcelain, as if his fingers would bruise my flesh. I brushed my finger over the photograph again, lingering on the curve of Mark's cheek. It had been good. I struggled to my feet and went to the kitchen for a glass of wine. If I was going to saunter down memory lane, I needed something to smooth the journey. It made sense to bring the bottle back with me. My past was a prickly place to visit. The balm of alcohol would be a necessity. With a pillow behind me and my legs curled under, I held the photograph of Mark in one hand while I sipped the nicely chilled Sauvignon and allowed myself to be swept back to a time when I really thought I was different. Or was it merely the times that were different? For those months we were together, I was determined to get the first that would ensure I had a good start in London, so was content to focus on my studies. When exams were over, when we had done as much as we could, and all we could do was wait for the outcome, that's when things changed. I can even pinpoint the exact moment. Mark and I had been together six months. Most of it had vanished in a haze of studying. Both of us determined to do well. But there were also hours, days, 
where we held hands, walked, talked, just happy to be together. He wasn't staying in Bristol for the summer, heading instead to his parents' home in Cheltenham. Come for a long weekend, Mark had urged after we'd celebrated for a few days, losing hours to hangovers. You haven't got a job yet. Make the most of it. My parents would love to meet you. His parents would love to meet me. I looked at his hand. That was it. The end of the idyll. I knew he loved me. He'd told me often enough. And I'd said the same. Meaningless words. I remembered my father saying the same as he'd tucked me into bed, pressing his scratchy face against my ten-year-old cheek, telling me how much he loved me. I remembered the words as if they were still echoing. The last words he'd ever said to me. The next morning, he was gone. Without an excuse or a goodbye. Never to be seen again. Thailand, my mother said, many days later when I dredged up the courage to ask. In the pain of abandonment, I remember promising that nobody was ever going to hurt me again. Far better to keep the barricades in place. Mark had come so very close to breaching them, but now they were reinforced, and it was time to end something that should never have begun. In any case, if he or his parents knew how I'd planned to earn my living during the summer, they'd have cast me aside lickety-split. I have job interviews lined up, I said, and stuck to that lie over the next few days until he left, promising to ring, to think of me every minute, to miss me desperately. Once he was gone, I convinced myself that those months were an aberration. It was as if I'd been in stasis for months and had suddenly woken up. I looked at my boring, nerdy clothes in horror and quickly dispatched them to the nearest charity shop before digging out my older, skimpier, trendier clothes and stepping back into the life I had lived prior to meeting him. It didn't take long to pick up the strings, old friends behaving as if I hadn't vanished for months, old men friends delighted to date my calls, more than delighted to fall back into our very satisfyingly lucrative arrangement. Mark's calls to me went unanswered. His increasingly desperate messages deleted, unread. I supposed I hoped he'd get the hint without my having to say the words. Perhaps I should have anticipated his next step. If I had, I'd have warned my housemates that Mark and I were over. I'd have told them to tell him, or anyone else who came looking, that I'd left, gone abroad, somewhere, anywhere. I climbed out of the taxi late one evening, one of my elderly friends sliding out behind me. His hands were all over, determined as he was to get value for the money he'd given me. I was wearing one of my come-hither dresses. Not that this particular man needed any encouragement, but it was part of the service I gave to look so fabulous that every man would lust after me, making the man I was with feel like a god to have me. The dress was short, low-cut, skin tight. We were laughing as the taxi pulled away. Mine was forced, my elderly companion's laugh lecherous and expectant. I was trying to get him indoors, not that I was prudish, but neighbours had already complained to the landlord about the behaviour of some of the tenants. My housemates were game to experiment and weren't averse to swapping partners or having a menage a trois or quatre, depending on who was willing or able to partake but they weren't at all interested in entering into a business arrangement. They didn't say, but I knew they thought I was a slut to get paid for what they were all giving away for free. Perhaps they'd have been more impressed if they knew just how much I did earn. Dimitri, the man whose hands were desperately trying to get their bony fingers around my nipples, 
was one of my better investments. A few hours laughing at his idiotic, misogynist, racist jokes, a meal at one of Bristol's finest restaurants, ten minutes or so while his little pecker poked away, a bit of acting as I shouted my pleasure, not at what he was doing, but that it was almost over. Two hundred quid well earned. I was thinking of the money when I saw a figure move from the shadow of one of the overgrown bushes in the small front garden. Guilt, vying with irritation, when I saw who it was. Mark. Chapter Six I fumbled in my bag for my keys and opened the door.